Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'd like to start by thanking the sponsor of today's episode, Sandra Bird, author of the Tudor Ladies in Waiting series. A rich alchemy of fact and fiction, these critically acclaimed books chronicle the glittering court lives of three queens and their closest friends and companions. The novels brim with heartwarming and heartbreaking circumstances and heroines who choose lives worth risking all. Book One, To Die For, follows Queen Anne Boleyn through the viewpoint of Margaret Wyatt. Library Journal awarded it a Best Books of the Year pick and said the novel brings history to life in exquisite detail. Book two, The Secret Keeper, uncovers love and betrayal in the life of Queen Catherine Parr. Library Journal calls the book atmospheric, full of twists, and a must-read for Tudor fiction fans. Finally, book three, Roses Have Thorns, draws close to Queen Elizabeth I through Ellen von Snakenborg, who transformed into Helena, the Marchioness of Northampton. I loved all three books and found this concluding book masterful, impeccably researched and deliciously detailed storytelling. This series is available at Amazon.com. As always, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the generous listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Now is actually a great time to join because you'll receive a month free when you pledge annually. Join the Talking Tutors patron family to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to enter patron-only monthly giveaways. July's prize is a Six Queens and a King trivia game, kindly sponsored by Horton Games. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. James Taft back to the show to chat about what it was like to serve a Tudor queen. Dr. Taff is a Tudor historian whose research focuses on kingship, queenship, the English royal household and the wider court, concentrating foremost on the households of Henry VIII and his six queens. Born in Birmingham, England, he studied at Queen Mary, University of London and University of Birmingham before moving to the northeast around four years ago to study for his PhD at Durham University, which he completed in 2022. He now lives in Newcastle, United Kingdom. Courting Scandal, The Rise and Fall of Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford is his first publication. Let's dive straight in. Welcome back to Talking Tudors, James. How are you? Hi, Natalie. Yes, I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for having me back. Yes, I've been looking forward to this conversation, actually. So before we we kind of dive in, would you mind just introducing yourself again to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background? Yes, absolutely. So um, my name is James and um, I'm a Tudor historian. I'm originally from Birmingham in the UK, but I live in Newcastle now. And I focusing my research on Tudor royal servants and households and the wider court. And my next book um, is entitled, quite straightforwardly, Serving the Tudors. And I'm hoping to investigate the lives and careers of all the men and women who served Tudor kings, queens, princes and princesses. That's wonderful. I got very excited when I saw you post the cover of your book on Twitter recently, actually. I can't wait to read it. 
Yes, um, hopefully that wasn't a bit too premature, that one. I, no, no, <laughs> I'm still researching and I'm still writing it. But So we are actually here today to talk about serving a Tudor queen and what that was like. So maybe let's begin with you just telling us a little bit about the general overall structure of the queen's household. Yes, of course. So I would say that the most useful description for the structure of the queen's household is to distinguish between the above stairs and the below stairs. So the above stairs, also known as the chamber, was responsible for attending upon her personally, performing menial or routine tasks on her behalf, such as making her bed or waiting on her at table, dressing and undressing her, standing guard in her chambers. Um, But everything that was above stairs was facilitated by this operation below stairs. So they were concerned with administering various provisions like food, drink, light, fuel, Anything really for like warmth, security and shelter essentially was provided below stairs. And there were also some other departments in that structure on the periphery, which might fairly be treated as separate from the household, but I think were very closely associated, like the Queen's wardrobe, um, her council and her stables. But it is the chamber, um, the household above stairs, essentially, on which we concentrate, because those servants are the ones who had the access, um, who had the opportunity then to interact with the Queen and the wider court. And they were essentially the core or the beating heart of her household, as I like to think of it. And that's where the life is. But that isn't to say that there aren't important stories to tell from the view of other departments. They're just much more difficult to reconstruct from the evidence. Thinking some more about the structure of the Queen's household, an important observation I think to make is that Tudor Queen's consort, like Catherine of Aragon or Anne Boleyn, they inherited this household from their medieval predecessors, which was very firmly integrated and treated as an extension of the King's household. It sort of mirrors the structural makeup and develops alongside the King's side. So when the King develops his privy chamber, a privy chamber also appears magically on the Queen's side. And um, like the King's household too, the Queen's household is very rigidly constructed. It's, a, it's this hierarchy, essentially. And servants, all of her servants would have had a very fixed position um, known as their office. So you have your Lord Chamberlain, your Vice Chamberlain, and then you have the gentleman ushers who had charge of yeomen, grooms and pages. And then in the Queen's innermost circle, you will have had her ladies and her gentlewomen, and then the more humble chamberers below them. So these can be differentiated not only by their social status, but by the duties that they performed too. But I think one of the most fascinating things that I found looking at the evidence was that at the peak of the structure, at the peak of the hierarchy, yeah, in many respects, the queen is mistress of the household. She is in charge. But it has to be acknowledged that with Henry VIII's queens, they did not really rule their households absolutely. So the true peak of that hierarchy is the king. And in some circumstances, queens were essentially figureheads. And how this dynamic affected the careers and the lives of servants and their politics, advancement, religion is what I'm most interested in and where I feel like I'm beginning to carve out my argument when it comes to understanding the Tudor court. That's so fascinating. And and so if one wanted to obtain a role at court in the Queen's household, how would you go about that? And maybe also touching on what skills were required as well. Oh, yes, absolutely. This question, I have to be honest, comes up a lot. And it was one that I was very preoccupied with in the early days of research. What it was perhaps most striking to me, or maybe surprising, is that there are very few qualifications or prerequisites for serving in the household of a queen. So some positions had built in requirements or expectations like yeomen of the chamber because they were standing guard had to be surely fairly stout and fit. And Henry VII and Henry VIII both make remarks about maids of honour and ladies at court having to be fair uh, or at least not ugly, as Henry VII said, um, or meet for the room, as Henry VIII famously remarked. So beauty could be a prerequisite for women serving at court. And other factors like social status, uh, familial ties, geographical origins, they were all certainly factors too. There are occasionally references to skills that I think suggest that some women especially were retained because of their talents, whether it was sewing so, or even just their ability to, to dress the Queen. Mary Queen of Scots, I think, uh, praised Mary Seaton for being the finest dresser of a woman's head. And those skills like sewing and dancing, singing, witty banter, they were all very highly prized in the court of a king and in the household of a queen. But if there were many individuals who were qualified, and there were loads of very, very talented uh, noble women and genteel women, and positions in the household were so highly coveted, who gets the position? And I think that's when it comes down to 
who did you know at court? Who is in charge of appointments? And that's another question itself. It's not so straightforward. Who actually held the power and the authority to actually grant these positions? And how was their choice determined? Were they were they influenced by skills? Or was it more, your family has served us before? So let's keep with the tradition. And the evidence is really inconsistent, to be honest. But I think with the Queen's household, I've sort of landed on this idea that Queen's certainly had agency in uh, choosing who they wanted to serve them. And that is most reflected in the fact that petitioners did solicit queens directly. And they did also solicit her servants so that they tried to get into the household that way. My go-to example would be the letter that Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife, receives from Joan Bomer, an old acquaintance with whom she'd served uh, Agnes Tilney, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. So Joan begins the letter by sort of stressing that she's in the most misery of the world and living a most wretched life, as she calls it. Um, and then she gets to the point. She sort of urges Catherine to remember this love that she had always borne the Queen. And she says something along the lines of, I beseech you to stay some room for me, and room being office or position at court, and that you shall think best for yourself, for the nearer I were to you, the gladder I would be. And I think it's clear enough here that Joan knew Catherine had the power to bring her to court. And I like to stay with Catherine here and say that when she was later arrested and commit, um, arrested on suspicion of committing adultery, the fact that she was held personally responsible for appointing Francis Durham and Catherine Tilney would be used against her to secure her conviction. Admittedly, that evidence is slightly less straightforward to use, but I think those on balance, the, this kind of evidence shows that queens did have power and they could appoint servants when they wanted to. But we have to be cautious because Catherine Howard was able to surround herself with these companions, but her predecessor, Anne of Cleves, does not appear to have been granted nearly the same courtesy. So more often the evidence might suggest that it was the king who held ultimate authority over appointments and queens might then require his consent, as we see when Catherine Parr writes to him while he's at war with France, casually asking if she can have certain ladies accepted into her chamber. And although Henry concedes and says it's up to her own choice, he does have an opinion on it, and he does care about who is staffing his queen's, the queen's side of the court. Um, so what all this meant for how you could obtain a position, essentially, is that men and women who aspired to surface, they had more than one channel for which to petition. It was who they knew and whose ear they could bend, who at court they could flatter and bribe, you know, and whether they could actually make a claim to office, whether it's with the queen, the king, their counsellors or their attendants to speak on their behalf. Yeah, so interesting. Another example jumps to mind, which I think was Lady Lyle in Calais trying to get a position for one or both of her daughters. I can't remember in Jane Seymour's household. And that took a very long time. It was sort of back and forth communications with her agent in London and with, I think, um, one of the Queen's ladies as well, trying to get in there. So yeah, it might be tricky at times, I think. Yes, absolutely. That example is, is just excellent. It really, if it were not for the Lyle letters, we would know not ha half as much as we know about the Queen's household, and especially that jockeying for position and trying to get someone appointed. The, the letters really do make it very clear that it wasn't so straightforward as here's a daughter of mine, and she's, she qualifies, you know, they really had to aggressively pursue and court the Queen to get to get into the household. Very true. And for any of our listeners, if you haven't had a look at the Lyle letters, please do. They are absolutely fabulous. There's a sort of summary version that you can get to have a little taste of it. But if you're like me, you buy all the volumes. So you've got every single, <laughs> every single letter. So you mentioned before, James, that even within the household, there's a there's a hierarchy. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the difference between, for example, ladies of the privy chamber and then maids of honor. And, and maybe go a little bit more into what the duties actually involve. Involved in those positions? Of course, yes. So these titles, which were and still are used today to distinguish between women at court, like ladies and gentlewomen of the Privy Chamber, or maids of honour, or chamberers, these are all what were known to the Tudors as officers. And essentially, that was the rank or position that was held by a servant. What duties and functions the Queen's servants performed, and what position they held in this sort of institutional chain of command, but not just that, but also how much they were paid, where and what they ate, how many horses they were allowed to stable, how many beds they were allowed for their own servants, and what kind of perks they got up for the job. Even what they wore, all of this was determined by what position they held, their office, essentially. This was their position as it was formally defined. And because the Queen's household was headed by the wife of the sovereign, a woman, many of her servants had to be women. But household ordinances, which essentially describe the state of the household and how it should be. There's no contemporary description in those ordinances of what a lady of the privy chamber or a maid of honour actually did. 
even when Mary I or Elizabeth I were on the throne as Queen's Regnant, no further distinction was made or even felt necessary between the male servants who had served the king and the female counterparts who would now serve the queen. So the fact that these servants were on the queen's side and the fact that they were women was in many ways inconsequential because although the offices had been developed and defined for men and by men, very few ad adaptations were required to accommodate women in those positions. So it's my theory that to identify the tasks and functions of women, we essentially just have to look at the offices who are those offices in the king's household, which are absent from the queen's side. So which essentially, and it's no coincidence, were the most intimate of the king's servants because the most intimate of the queen's servants then had to be changed out for women. So the um, ladies and gentlemen of the privy chamber were responsible for the queen's more sort of everyday service when she retreated and relaxed in private. They were like the gentlemen of the privy chamber in the sense that they would dress and undress the queen, wash and bathe her, presumably as well styling her hair and applying her makeup, and waiting on her personally when no one else at court was allowed to even presume to go anywhere near her or touch her. Chamberers were essentially the female equivalent of grooms of the privy chamber, in that they were responsible for the more menial and routine tasks of cleaning and maintaining the queen's chambers, arranging her clothes and jewels and bed linen and uh, fetching sort of all manner of things on, on her behalf. And then outside of the privy chamber, there were ladies in presence, also known as great ladies, and maids of honour, who attended upon the queen more often in the presence chamber when she dined, and especially when she was entertaining visitors to court, like ambassadors or dignitaries. So maids of honour also have the distinction of being thought to have been quite fit companions for a queen, especially a younger queen. And they accompanied her often when she left the chambers and, you know, carried her train behind her. It's, it's maids of honour who we most often see dramatised in serials and things like that. And the young girls had to be supervised because they were young, and they were chaperoned by someone known as the mother of the maids, who essentially ensured that they always behaved in a in a sort of sober and virtuous manner. But I always hasten to add when I'm talking about offices that it must be said they don't reflect the full role undertaken by the Queen's servants. So in terms of duties and tasks, nothing was outside of the scope of what they could do as servants because because of their intimacy, because of how far they were drawn into the Queen's affairs, anything could be asked of them. Whereas unlike the King's men, the Queen's ladies and gentlewomen wouldn't be involved in national administration, local government, making policy, military assistance, secretarial duties like obtaining the King's signature, because Queen's did not govern, well, Queen's consort did not govern, I should stress. Their servants functioned then for the practice and display of queenship. And there's not nearly enough time to date to unpack exactly what queenship is and how the Queen's household then met those functions. But dare I say it, those of your listeners who sign up to uh, the On the Tudor Trails 365 Days with the Tudor Queens will hear much more about it in greater detail as part of my lecture on queenship there. Oh, well, I can't wait for that because I'm I'm totally obsessed with queenship at the moment. Queenship and wall paintings, believe it or not. <laughs> That's my current. Um, <laughs> That's, That's quite the combination. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Exactly. So you mentioned there while you were talking payments and perks. So in terms of compensation for these women serving the queen, is it more just about, you know, you've got the queen's ear, you can have rewards, that kind of thing, or are you getting monetary compensation? Uh, yeah, so certainly all of the queen's servants had to be paid and provided for. Most of them, I should say, received wages, which was like an annual salary that they got paid monthly, quarterly or yearly. And those stipends were calibrated against the office that a servant held. So a Queen's Lord Chamberlain was paid £40 a year, but his deputy was paid around £26 a year. Um, maids of honour were paid £10 a year, but her chamberers were received around £6 a year. They were sort of calibrated with their office, but the costs that they incurred for attending at court meant that some of these wages might be fairly described as modest, if not meagre. And there is a great little remark, um, going back to, as you said, the Lyle letters, where uh, John Hussey writes back and says, for Lady Lyle's daughter, the Queen will only pay her but £10 a year. And just that word but being in there always makes me think he obviously didn't think it was very much, considering how much they would have to spend on getting Anne to the court and properly dressed, properly attired, and to have everything that she needed to actually be fit to serve on the Queen. It was but £10 a year she would receive. But they did receive some other benefits too. So the Queen's servants received um, expensive materials to make up their own livery, which was the clothing that they wore as to mark them publicly as servants. Um, many of them were given their own lodgings in royal palaces, and they were entitled to stabling and beds for their servants. The right to retrieve rations of food and drink, bread, ale and wine, fuel and candles and things like that. Uh, some attendants received tips or fees, which were like non-monetary perquisites of the job. Ladies and gentlewomen more often received 
clothing in that respect. So any clothes that they might have wore as part of a mask or a pageant, they were generally allowed to keep. Overall, I think mostly what attracted people to royal service was not wages. It was more like the potential for advancement. And this all came from being intimate with the crown and to knowing the king or the queen personally. And although there is a lot of scholarship on the politics of intimacy for the king's side of the court, I don't feel like there is nearly as much or as there should be on the queen's side in terms of how her women might have received royal patronage or one favour at court. And one only really needs to look at the inventories and wills of Tudor queens to see how generous they were to their servants in giving them money, clothes, jewels, plate, food. And that was no accident. That was part of the deal, essentially. It was expected that queens would give recognition to their service and strengthen these bonds of obligation and goodwill by rewarding them and advancing them and taking care of their interests. I remember Catherine of Aragon says something like, she felt herself to be particularly anxious to be good and to those who take of labor doing me service. And Anne Boleyn says something like, well, according to William Latimer anyway, Anne Boleyn says something like she would assuredly prefer her own servants first because something along the lines of the benefits that they give to her, they are her true servants and take pain to death or something like that. So that there's there, there are these inferences in the sources about uh, individuals who are in service deserve to be rewarded. Their their service deserves to be recognized. And I think I feel like I should make some distinction here between the advancement that men could be entitled to and women. There are positions and like um, titles, honors, lands, leases, licenses that generally went to men before they went to women. And so a great example of this is that there is a document that survives um, it was drawn up in preparation for when Catherine of Aragon's estate was to be handed over to Anne Boleyn, and it was addressing all of Catherine of Aragon's attendants who held positions in her estate, whether it's as a steward or a bailiff or a receiver or a keeper or a constable. And there's around 30 of those recipients who can be identified as people who served her in her household, but only one of them's a woman, and it was Margaret, Lady Grey, who receives something in the range of nine pounds as keeper of uh, Litley and Donmore Parks. And it's it's very rare that we come across women who held those kinds of positions. And those were the kind of positions which people love to hold because it just if you could hold several of them at once and accrue a very substantial income from that. That's really interesting. I actually didn't know that a woman could hold that position. So that that's fascinating. I know the document you're talking about, but I'll have to look back at that. <laughs> so something that just popped into my head, I don't know if you, you can answer this off the top of your head, but in your research, have you found that couples generally serve together? So like husband in the king's household and wife in the queen's household, was that quite common? Oh, yes, absolutely. It was especially in some house. I mean, the household that comes to mind is Catherine Parr's, which I think there is a lot of overlap between the gentlemen of the privy chamber and the ladies on her side. It's quite often the sisters, the wives, the daughters, and sometimes even the mothers who you find of the king's men in the queen's household. And I think those those networks and those relationships were definitely significant for many reasons, if not just the fact of having more of a presence at court means you're more visible to the crown and you're much more valued as a family and the family name is sort of strengthened, your your ties to the crown are strengthened. I'm thinking in a practical sense too, just in terms of getting the work done, the most immediate example that comes to mind is Eleanor, the Countess of Rutland, who is the wife of Thomas Rutland, uh, sorry, Thomas Manners, the Earl of Rutland. And Thomas Manners was Lord Chamberlain of the Queen's household for many years, and Eleanor was Lady of the Privy Chamber. Between the two of them, those two positions were quite senior, quite powerful. And I like to imagine that the two of them effectively governed the Queen's household for this would have been the Anne of Cleves years, the Catherine Howard years, the Catherine, not so much the Catherine Parr years, but in the late 1530s and early 1540s, the Rutlands were surely in charge and surely had all their bases covered. The Lord Chamberlain was quite powerful in terms of what he could do for the household, but he didn't really govern the in the privy chamber. He, that was the women's domain, I like to believe. And so the fact that he, his wife was inside the privy chamber means that he always had eyes on the innermost sanctum. I, I like to imagine that the two of them 
would meet up, you know, perhaps for breakfast and would exchange little details about what they've picked up on at court. Yeah, I have to say, I missed out one thing when I said my current obsessions, networking is another one because I, I find oh, it yes. <laughs> mind boggling when you start looking for those connections. And I'm particularly interested in the female networks. So mm-hmm. It's actually incredible how everyone is connected and almost everyone's related <laughs> through marriage. Or, yes. You know, <laughs> it, it's quite yeah, amazing. Absolutely. Really fascinating. All right. So I know when I was looking at the end of Anne Boleyn's queenship and life that I was not surprised, but I suppose what stood out to me was that so many of her women then end up, of course, in the household of Jane Seymour. So maybe talk to us a little bit about transitioning from one queen to the next. Is this an automatic thing? Do you need to reapply? How does it work? This is my favorite topic. Um, I, I could talk about this forever and I'll try and resist the urge to. Because Henry VIII married six times, as we know, there were six separate queen's households established during the reign. And this meant that no, on no less than five occasions, it had to be discharged and all of the servants were disbanded. They didn't actually just keep their position and as holdovers to the next queen automatically. It was always discharged, no matter what, even if there was another queen lined up, as, as in the case of Jane Seymour. So the king's marital instability would have very directly impacted the lives and careers of not only his wives, but those who were nearest to them, especially. Um, new queens had to bring in their own servants. They, those servants would have displaced those of former queens. So on the day of Anne Boleyn's execution, it was reported, um, I love this quote, that most of the late queen servants were set at liberty to seek service elsewhere, and a poem described them as sheep without a shepherd. And that really sort of gives me this visual imagery of of these servants who were just with their sort of heads bowed in mourning for their late mistress completely lost and not only have they lost someone pro- presumably quite dear to them but they are, their lives are going to be affected by this tragedy too and although it is difficult to measure the impact on lives because this is where they often disappear from the record so we don't really know what happens to them next some of them presumably retired to their homes others continued to seek preferment at court and Without the Queen, if they were appointed by the Queen especially, to speak on their behalf, very few kinsmen and women, so the Berlins, anyone who really was in because they were a friend of the Berlins, wouldn't have survived the scandal, really. And there are very few exceptions to that. But when she first became Queen, Anne would have built up this network, this sort of, as we were saying about networks, there's a female network, yes, but also a male network, which I think is often not properly considered. And... But infiltrating that network, again, would have been the king. As I was saying earlier, the king effectively controlled appointments. So when Anne's household is sort of discharged, it's not as if everyone is effectively ruled out. There are reliable, maybe 20 yeomen of the chamber, perhaps 15 of them at least, more closely associated with the king. And there's no reason why they should have to leave their office. There's no, They do the job perfectly well. They, they're able to serve Jane Seymour in the same capacity. But those who are closest to Anne, they wouldn't have been able to make the transition. And I think a general rule in this period is that if you were in with the king, then you were more likely to survive and make the transition. But even then, it probably wasn't certain because Henry's queens came and went and the king was always there. You would almost expect that if your relationship was with the king, that you had a job the entire time. But sometimes one person's claim as a new queen came in was stronger than yours. And there's no explanation for it other than they just disappear from the list and I'd love to speculate sometimes and say, well, why did they fall out of favor? But often I I imagine it's just because when, for instance, Catherine Howard came in, anyone who thought they had a thing with Anne of Cleves, it didn't matter. And, you know, six months is a long time in, in, at the, in the Tudor court. The king's favor would have been, gone from looking at certain noblemen to other noblemen and then favoring their daughters and their wives and their sisters. And I, I like this contrast. I always draw this contrast between So when Jane Seymour dies in 1537, we have Anne Bassett, the late Queen's Maid of Honour, who was given some assurance from the King that she would have her place when he remarried. And then you have John Croft, who was a gentleman waiter who struggles to find any place at court. He can't find a foothold. He has to essentially get the King's gentleman to beg on his behalf for some kind of place. So although careers were clearly made in relationships and those relationships with the Queen that they made were significant, it was the relationship with the king that mattered in terms of making that transition between households. I can see why this fascinates you. It's such an interesting subject, isn't it? (laughs) You know, it was the question that I had at the beginning of researching this. And even now, I feel like I haven't quite like nailed down exactly what I want to say. 
but I feel like I'm getting there. I, I, I am very preoccupied with this question. Just, I find it fascinating to think that so, so many people's lives were affected by the fact that the king needed, wanted a different wife. You know, we're so focused on the wife, as perhaps we should be, but then we don't think that they've got a hundred people behind them that are suddenly losing their job. What happens to them? Yeah, so interesting. And that's maybe why the queens were so concerned in in ensuring that they were properly sort of covered in wills, etc. Um, for that exact reason, I imagine that they realised oh, how definitely, um, changeable yes. the king is. And thinking about how you leave service, because we've talked about how you get into service, but, you know, especially I'm just thinking about some of the women that served Elizabeth, obviously, because of the longevity of her rule. You know, there are people that literally devoted their entire lives to service, especially when it comes to Elizabeth. So if you wanted to suddenly just, you know, go home and, and spend your final years quietly at home, could you retire from these these roles? This was a strangely difficult question that I encountered um, when researching. I, it, it's not always very clear. I, I think it sort of depends on who your royal master or mistress is. So we know men and women left service when they grew too old or if they became unwell. I think that they would have been granted the courtesy of being allowed to retire if they were no longer able to meet the often strenuous demands of royal service. Um, you know, the ordinances of the household say that anyone who's impotent, sickly, unable or unmeet should be discharged. And so if you get to a certain age and you're struggling to carry in the king's duble or, you know, or the queen's dress or something, then maybe maybe you should retire and maybe that they were maybe they were taken aside and some, someone had a quiet word you know but um and we know, we know offices did become vacant when servants were sick or if worse if they died and but there was no guarantee that a servant would retire when one might expect them to retire so again going back to the Lyle letters when uh, Marjorie Horsman married there was some suggestion that she might leave service because often when the queen's maids married they did leave service and then just work on their husband's estate and they retired from court but um when marjorie married she married a courtier and she remained at court and became one of the queen's gentlewomen instead so there was no real vacancy there that she kept her own room she kept her own chamber and there was no space that, that, that and so it quite probably varied it is important to think as well that some people were forced into retirement. So my one of my favorite examples of this is Catherine of Aragon's gentlewoman, Francisca. I'm, I'm going to butcher her name now, but I think it's Francisca de Cáceres? Cáceres? Cáceres, um, yeah. She, is, is that it? Yeah. And, um, and well, she was sort of forbidden to enter the palace one day by the queen because she'd sort of caught her acting as an informant for the uh, Spanish ambassador. And I find that just brilliant that just one day she woke up and realized she could no longer see the queen because she'd overstepped her mark. And Catherine Howard later on threatens to sort of shut certain chamberers out of her out of service because they wouldn't stop pestering her and coming to her bedchamber late at night and being nosy about what Catherine was doing in her chambers. So th those examples are good reminders that even though very, I imagine very few people were so punished so severely to be discharged from service, some people absolutely were. And I think that that's important to remember. But going back to your question about retirement, funnily enough, Elizabeth, she's probably the best case study for this. I can't think of an, a very obvious contemporary example in terms of Henry VIII's queens for retirement, but there is that great example about Sir Francis Knowles, who, when he was stationed at Bolton Castle as a custodian for Mary, Queen of Scots, he wrote to Elizabeth to request leave for his wife, Catherine, uh, Lady Knowles, so that she might accompany him. And in writing to Elizabeth, the Queen, Francis urged that his wife was unwell, that he, he thought that she required moderate travel and quietness of mind away from court. But Elizabeth outright refuses his request, saying, you know, she sort of excuses it and says that Catherine's journey up north might be to her danger. But actually, I, I read that as Elizabeth did, just did not want to give Catherine up. She did not want her to leave court. And then unfortunately Catherine dies without even being able to see her husband and it's such a tragic story but that when you talk about retirement that's what always comes to mind Catherine probably should have been allowed to retire if she was so unwell you know why why did Elizabeth insist on her remaining at court and I think that probably many servants felt an overwhelming pressure to please their royal master or mistress and in many ways I can imagine that became quite a strain especially if you just about had enough and they wouldn't let you go Yes, I can imagine that it must have been very intimidating approaching Elizabeth to request <laughs> any sort of leave. Oh or... my, yes. Oh goodness. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, maybe just to start wrapping the conversation up, could you tell us a little bit about a few of the women that you've researched uh, who did serve Tudor Queens? You've obviously mentioned some already in the course of the, the conversation, but maybe some others. 
Sure, yes. I mean, unfortunately, what I found with the Queen's servants is that the surviving source material being so fragmentary and the evidence not really being continuous or consistent, it's very difficult to reconstruct much more of a career of a lady-in-waiting than in a moment in time. So usually the reason they're in the evidence is because they're making their mark on history and perhaps acting beyond the role to which they were formerly circumscribed. And they caught the attention of an ambassador or a counsellor and that person scribbled down what they'd done. And that's usually when we get a better idea of who that person is, but it's very difficult to make much on one inference. So I think I mentioned Marjorie Horsman earlier on, and she always comes to mind when studying Anne Boleyn, and especially the fall of Anne Boleyn, because if we trust Cromwell's words, we are left with the impression that Anne's ladies and gentlewomen really did not hesitate to turn against her in 1536. But a very brief reference in a surviving letter by Sir Edward Bainton, who was Vice Chamberlain of the Queen's household, suggests that Marjorie in particular was less than cooperative with the efforts of the prosecution to implicate the Queen and to substantiate these accusations laid against her. And I just love her for that. I think, I mean, afterwards she becomes one of Jane Seymour's closest attendants too. So she, not to say that she can't adapt. She was an adaptable lady, but it really strikes me that this slight glimmer of hope in the sense that maybe Anne's household didn't completely sell her down the river, you know, maybe, maybe they actually buckled under pressure and maybe some of them gave up much less than they could have. That's what I like to think anyway. And um, we've also mentioned Anne Bassett, who, you know, the daughter of Lady La, who really honestly appears to be almost as insufferable as her mother to me. She, the, the evidence which survives, the letters, they, I've read them over and over again. And by the, by the time you've read them a third time, you really can't stand these women. I mean, they're just, Anne is very petulant. She's always demanding more, more this, more that. I need this, I need this. I need clothes, I need pearls, I need I need to look visibly striking at court. And it sort of starts to grate on you when you're reading it. But the Lyle letters, as you were saying, uh, Natalie, were, are extraordinary. And they do place Anne as a central character in the story of the Queen's side of the court. And I think that, especially in those later years, the 1530s and 1540s, where we we sort of lose central characters with when we lose Anne Boleyn and when we lose Catherine of Aragon, we lose the central women at court. Anne Bassett then emerges as she not only has the Lyle letters, but she also catches the king's attention too, and becomes something of an influence at court during those years. And of course, we mentioned um, the Countess of Rutland, Eleanor. And again, I, I, I would love to do more work on the power of couples at court and to look more at those relationships between men on the king's side and women on the other side, because that has to be, there has to be something there. Whether the evidence will give it to us, I don't know. Some other ladies, I mean, I could, honestly, as you can probably tell, I could probably roll these off for hours and hours and hours. I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with two more, which I, I really do like to name check. Um, Elizabeth Stafford, the Duchess of Norfolk, and Maria de Salinas, uh, Lady Willoughby. Both served Catherine of Aragon for more than 20 or 30 years, respectively. Their undying loyalty to their mistress is so compelling, sometimes gut-wrenching. It's really no surprise to me that the Queen loved Maria more than any other mortal, as she said, because their bond really does come through in the evidence. And, um, and you know, that's very fortunate for us. I cannot really get over the imagery of the Duchess of Norfolk sort of secretly putting in letters from the ambassador into an orange so that she can smuggle them to her mistress. I always come back to that source and think, doesn't that just say a, just everything that you need to know? You know, that the fact that she would do that, the fact that she felt it necessary to do that, the fact that she was sort of savvy and astute enough to be careful and cautious. And oh, yes, honestly, I could go on and on. I mean, the, the men who served Henry Henry's queens are important too. The women are the ones who we focus on. I would like to see more work on the men. They are just as interesting. And I, I think they have to be studied together. As I was saying about court couples, not just that, but the men on the king's side and the women on the queen's side, yes. But what about the men on the queen's side and the women on the queen's side? Though they must have cooperated, they must have worked together. And I think in capturing a fuller picture of the court, we have to look at working relationships at court too. And how sort of if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine, sort of how, how much of that how many how much cooperation was there at court or was it all very self-serving is what I like to think about yeah I think there was quite a lot of 
back scratching, as you say. And and look, James, you've got your third book all ready to go, Power Couples at Court. I love it. I'll be the first one to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> that would that might end up being a very short book. I would love someone to defy, <laughs> defy my suspicion there. But I my impression is that it might just be a very long list of names. Like, look, <laughs> look who's over here and look who's over there. Um, I would love to do more. So maybe it's an article in the making. I think there could be something. something. I think there's something in it. And and I was having a little giggle when you mentioned John Hussey because the poor guy, sometimes I feel like in the tone of his letters, you can hear that he's just overwhelmed with Lady Lyle <laughs> and her demands and her daughters. Oh, yes. Oh, the poor man. I really, he's... I love him because thank God we've got his letters. But yeah, sometimes I really feel for him. Me too. I, I love him. He's he's so, clearly so exasperated, yeah. but he doesn't for a second drop a single detail. You know, he, he always puts it in. And you can imagine sometimes he just wanted to just completely ignore the situation because he must have found it to be so tedious, you know. But he took his job very seriously. And he's one of those very sort of tireless Tudor servants who really deserve greater recognition, you know. But then his name is in is in so many books because of the beautiful extraordinary sources that he's left behind absolutely and the, and the very last question i have for you james is of course the tudor takeaway so this is something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode so do you have a takeaway for us yes certainly um i have never been more excited for the, a book to come out than i am for the new book by gareth russell which is entitled the palace and he is going to cover the history of hampton court for the past 500 years from the Tudors to the Windsors. Now, the Tudors is sort of where, I, where I'm where i most interested in, and, and where I will be most keen to see what he has found. But it's just, he has such a way of painting a picture and it's going to be the most perfect book for if these walls could talk. You know, Hampton Court is a fantastic setting. He is a brilliant writer and I am just so, I, I would highly recommend anything that he has written, to be honest, because I've read it all and it's it's all fantastic. But this this book in particular, hotly anticipated, I think I heard about it a couple of years ago and I was like, oh, I hope he does it because that's a great idea. And now we're only a month or two away from it coming out. I'm really excited. And I think your, your listeners should definitely check that out. Absolutely. I feel the same. Hampton Court is probably my favorite historic site in the world. So pre-ordered my copy. So I recommend everyone yeah. do the same. And you're right. I love all of Gareth's books. His Catherine Howard biography is my is one of my favorites. So if you're interested in Catherine Howard, definitely I recommend that one as well. James, this has been so wonderful. Such a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for coming back on the podcast and talking Tudors with us. Natalie, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, please just have me back whenever you want. I love Talking Tudors. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners. So if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.